Now, in the late 1800s, you know, following Jefferson's work, we do start to see more and more kind of scientific approach to archaeology, um, other ways to record data. So Alexander Kahn's was the first to use architects. He brought them out to look at structures that he had or that were on the site, and he also took a lot of photographs. The first time photography was used on an archaeological project, and of course now it's standard. We take tons and tons of photographs. Ernst Curtis and Wilhelm Dortfield did detailed stratigraphy of Olympia. So again, jumping off of Jefferson's work, but using more detail. Augustus Fox Pitt Rivers revolutionized archaeology. Um, one of the things he did that was so radical is he actually trained his personnel before they went into the field. So everybody knew how to dig and how to do it in a more precise manner because they had the training beforehand. He did detailed records. He marked his excavation units with medallions that had the year imprinted on it. So, and this is something that actually a lot of archaeologists still do today because it shows the perimeter of your excavation unit. Anybody digging in the future would be able to, to mark it off pretty easily. And one of the other things that's really important about Pit, Fox Pit Rivers is that he realized that time and space context was important if we were going to reconstruct past life ways. So this is why his detailed records are so important because it helped us to establish um, the space of where the artifacts came from and at least provided some general ordering of what came first. Uh, Christian Thompson here in the bottom right w developed an ordering system. He came up with the three H system for Europe and this is to kind of follow cultural changes in a predictable sequence based on the favored raw materials of a time period. So he came up with three, the Stone Age, Bronze Age, and Iron Age. Now again, this was developed for Europe. It does not work in the Americas. Um, so it's pretty regionally specific. Now that brings us, that's a very brief history of archaeology. I mean, I could go on. Um, if you want to know more about the history of archaeology, then you should take the archaeology class. And that was, or you want to check your catalog to see when that's going to be offered. But what I want to do now is talk about some of the paradigms that are used in archaeology. And a paradigm is simply a way of thinking and doing things that's guided by a particular theory or theories. So it's, again, a way to help direct our ways of doing things and thinking. And now the earliest paradigm that we're going to talk about that was specifically developed, you know, for anthropology is called unilineal evolution. Um, and it's kind of a corruption of Darwin's theory of evolution, which I want to spend a little bit of time talking about because Darwin's theory, of course, is the backbone of most of the sciences today. So I think it's important to kind of understand that a little bit. So we're going to look at some of the history of how that theory was developed. So prior to Darwin's publication of On the Origin of Species by Natural Selection, pretty much Europe believed, and of course the North America and everywhere the Europeans had colonized, um, believed in creationism. So the world was a result of God's divine plan. We can kind of see this idea of plans even further back if we look at Aristotle, who came up with this idea of the scala natura, or this chain of being, this scale of nature. So everything can be really well ordered from inanimate all the way up to human beings. Um, when Christianity became the dominant kind of worldview in Europe, they added a couple levels. Above human beings, they added angels and then God. So this provided a basic order, but still putting humans, you know, way above everything else. And it really did kind of follow, particularly later on in Europe, this more Christian ideology. Now John Ray, in six, who was born in 1691, um, was a philosopher and he wrote a lot about nature. And he believed that the purpose of science was to illuminate God's wisdom. He did believe that the world could change, but this was going to be the result of cataclysms. But this didn't necessarily negate the whole of God's plans. He thought that nature was fundamentally fixed. So yeah, it could change, you know, a flood might change some of the landscape and so forth, but the basic nature of the world did not change. Now, other people in the 17th century 
thought that the world was a desecration of an earlier perfect world that had originally been created by God. And they thought that through science we could understand the processes used by God to create the world and then understand the processes that were acting to promote the desecration of the world. Now part of this debate was how old was the world? You know, how long had it taken the world to reach the state of decay? And there were several people working on it. Two of the most famous were um, Lightfoot and Usher. Lightfoot calculated the beginning of Earth to 3928 BC or 5928 years ago. And Usher did 4004 BC, but he was even more precise. It was October 23rd at 12.01 a.m. So they used the begats in the Bible to calculate the age of Earth. The problem was that some people didn't think that these dates allowed enough time for the world to reach its 17th century state. So they suggested that catastrophes were responsible for quite a bit of the desecration of the world. So we see this emergence of catastrophe theory. So people were finding fossils of animals that looked kind of similar to modern anim animals but weren't quite the same. So they decided that these natural catastrophes were would explain these extinction of these earlier forms and then new or better forms were created in their place. Um, so it, it explained change, but the catastrophes, these were all part of God's plan. Um, and they, they used Noah's flood as an example. And this was actually fairly popular. However, it didn't uh, satisfy everybody. So there you have people like Buffon who explained changes in the world in a more natural way. He specifically challenged the church, and this is Buffon up here in the, uh, in the picture, by saying that the world could be explained naturally and that didn't have to be this divine creation. Um, so you can imagine during this time frame what an uproar that caused. Um, also during this time frame we have geologists that are working like James Hattoon who suggested that the processes of change were actually pretty steady and they happened over long periods of time. Um, there were regular uniform processes that constantly worked to promote change. And he arrived at these ideas through his observations. He looked at marine shells on dry land and tried to explain how they got there. He was the first person to suggest a rather ancient origin to the world. Something that would be long enough to account for mountain building and canyon formation and river courses. I believe he suggested it was about 70,000 years old. Something again shocking for this time period. It was just highly controversial and he took quite a bit of flack over the proposition. But he wasn't the only geologist thinking about the age of the Earth. Charles Lyell took Hutton, a lot of Hutton's ideas and refined and expanded them and, and published in 1830 a book called The Principles of Geology, which became kind of the standard for geology students. And he kind of codified this idea that Hutton had had about these um, processes that were working over time and coined it the principle of uniformitarianism so that earth is formed by slow and pretty gradual processes and so that the same processes that work to form earth were still working in the present day so erosion weathering uplift things like that so this idea of gradual change is kind of critical in in darwin's theory that we're going to talk about next uh, lyle suggested that the earth took over a hundred thousand years to form. So again, putting some long periods of time, pushing back the age of the earth quite a bit. But it's it's kind of important to understand that both Lyle and Hatun were not necessarily trying to deny God's creation. They just didn't agree with the time frame that people were putting on it. But this brings us to Charles Darwin. It's important to know that Charles Darwin was a Christian. He for most of his life, I should say, he did attend theolog theological school, so he was pretty well versed in the Bible. He developed his theory over a very long period of time, and it developed out of what he knew about geologic principles that he had read in Lyle's book, and he believed that change took a long time, so steady, gradual change. 
He was familiar with earlier theories of biological evolution, specifically Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, who developed the first biological theory of evolution. He believed that new species could result from spontaneous generation, just kind of farming out of nothing, basically. And he also believed in this idea of the use and disuse of organs. So if an animal, an individual animal, perceived a need, like we can use the giraffe as the example, a short-necked giraffe perceived a need to get resources at a higher spot could somehow, through different kinds of biles and stuff within the body, would could stretch its neck and then could g reach those higher resources and then when it bred, it would pass on that longer neck to its offspring, and that's the inheritance of acquired characteristics. If it wasn't using an organ, it would just go away. So that's kind of Baptiste, it's kind of like the first real attempt at a biological explanation for change.